Ladies and gentlemen, well, you'd be very pleased. I'm not going to talk to you about VAT anyway. So we're going to, I have my other hat on today, and that is uh, immigration. Immigration is one of the most complex subjects that any government needs to address. There are so many issues, many of them conflicting, that need to be taken into consideration when developing immigration and migration strategies and policies. Governments worldwide struggle with determining the measures required to control the influx of persons into their jurisdiction. Here on the Isle of Man, we may not have some of the issues that larger governments have, but we certainly have issues we need to address. And any strategy for immigration has to reflect uh, and integrate with labour market policies, economic policies, housing policies, social and educational policies. So today, I'd like to go over some of those issues and how we have started to address them. Earlier this year, the operational side of passports, immigration and nationality moved to Treasury to sit alongside Customs and Excise under the new divisional banner of Customs and Immigration. This was at a time when the relatively small team of 17 were experiencing difficulties in processing the volumes of immigration and passport applications being received. This relatively small team were also required to meet vessels and aircraft arriving from outside the common travel area, which now included those arriving from the EU. Tackling the abuse of the immigration system was becoming even more apparent. To keep up with the constant changes in regulation and legislation, and on top of all of this, undertake the massive project of digitizing the immigration passport and nationality systems. In April this year, we hit an all-time high for processing times of visa applications, on average 90 days. This didn't include the processing times of applications for certificates of employment, which is required for those working on a working visa, which at the time was also taking around 45 days. This was clearly not acceptable. It was not a position we wanted to be in, and applications Applicants were complaining, as were employers, and quite rightly so. So we did need to end... Why did we end up in this position? Well, we can't blame everything on Brexit, but it clearly had a large part to play. As a consequence of the UK leaving the EU, everyone other than British and Irish nationals now come under the immigration control. Because we had a lockdown for COVID, the effect of Brexit didn't really kick in until 21, 22, when people started traveling again. In 21, 22, we received 2,671 application, visa applications. Prior to that, it was always under 2,000. In 22, 23, this increased to 4,056 applications. This hasn't abated. 23 and 24 saw similar numbers. And this, even in the start of this year, 24, 25, this has continued. More applications were being received each month than the small team could possibly clear. There was a number of immigration system abuse cases rumbling in the background as well. The number of passports which we are issued in the same department has went through the roof at the same time. <clears throat> so the backlog due to COVID, but the levels of application for these also continue to remain high. Following Brexit, there was an increase in flights and boats that needed to be met. Immigration officers had to do these, such as charter flights from the EU, as well as non-charter uh, receipts of private jets and vessels. 
This all put a tremendous pressure on the staff on a day-to-day -day basis, who were working overtime on a regular basis for months to try and clear the backlog. The inevitable consequence was that we started to lose very experienced staff in this team. At the time of the transfer to Treasury, there was a total of 17 members of staff and the whole team, and we were down to three immigration officers who were able to process applications. On an average day, an officer can process around six to 10 applications. A complex case can take a whole day, and incomplete applications can take even longer to sort out. At this point, we had a backlog of over 780 applications, and I'm sure you can all do the maths. That would take us some considerable time to clear. So our first requirement was free up the officer's time to process as many applications as possible. One way we could do that was for the current officers to take the immigration procedures at the borders away from them. And this meant that the customs officers were to take on this, this procedure. The team needed to be expanded to enable the shift work and it took time for customs officers to learn the skills needed to take on the immigration work. But we expedited this to bring it forward, the handover. Although we are still not able to meet all flights and ferries from outside the CTA, you will have noticed a huge increase in the presence at the sea terminal and at the airport, with the requirements under the CTA being prioritised. This is our first year of shift work at the borders, and we are still finding our feet, but it is already a huge improvement on where we were six months ago. We then started the recruitment process for additional staff within immigration to increase the administration support for the officers that were processing applications. Additional officers would, would need to be trained and unfortunately, this does take some time. Immigration is a very complex subject. I'm sure you can appreciate that somebody can't just walk into these roles. We put in additional management support into the processes as well. Then we started looking at the IT. At the, IT. the processing of applications on our very, acquaint, uh, uh, very old systems was outdated. We could get very little management information out of those systems. Even to work out the, the days of turnaround was a manual process. We brought in government technology services to look at the customer management system, which now lets us track applications, giving them specific statuses, enables us to get statistics out of the system so we can monitor progress rather than having to spend days manually computing these. This system now enables us to prioritise applications such as visitor visas for TT and healthcare workers. At the height of the backlog with over 700 enabling applications, I am so very grateful that, for the dedication of the team to reduce the applications to a now around 380. We are not out of the woods yet, by any means, but the situation is starting to get under control. We still have a backlog with some of those cases remaining in the difficult category and over 90 days, but the majority of cases are now being turned around in around 45 days. In recent... In recent months, the other issue that we, we are dealing with in immigration is um, the cases that considerably have been progressing. I cannot give you the details on those cases, but I can give you the sort of things that we are seeing. Workers offered visas under fraudulent pretenses, traveling thousands of miles at great personal expense for jobs that simply don't exist or were not, or were, the jobs were not what they thought they were coming to do. 
and not the salary levels that they were led to believe that they would receive. Immigration, immigrants being charged fees for by employers for recruitment firms for obtaining visas which they had to pay back from their salaries. This additional expense would be difficult to meet when you are in, on a minimum wage and trying to support yourself and maybe your family paying rented accommodation and general living expenses. This leads to the potential for cramped housing conditions to save on costs and the use of food banks to make ends meet. This is not what we want to see in our society. We have also had those that have very little knowledge of the English language, which has made it difficult for us to determine the issues they are encountering. And we are, as a society, not geared to accommodate their needs. We don't have doctors that can speak to them in their own language or on tap interpreters for immigration officers or the constabulary to use. There is also the potential for the Isle of Man immigration system to be used as a backdoor to the UK. Under the Common Travel Area Agreement, we need to ensure that this does not happen. Where the immigration regulations differ to the UK presents us a risk, especially where it is easier or advantageous to attain an Isle of Man visa in, in order to gain unfettered access to the UK. Heavily reliant on paper documents is also a problem. It's also very open to the possibility of false documents being presented to obtain a visa. At this stage, we don't know the extent of the abuse in these areas, but it is, it's there. And in some cases, the evidence is suggesting that it is quite widespread. There is considerable work that needs to be done to extend that this is, includes working with the constabulary and the Department for Enterprise on the cases that we currently have, identifying areas of concern and making any necessary changes to policy legislation and procedures. We are also undertaking a review of the historic applications to look for patterns and trends to establish the extent of the abuse within the system. This should also identify areas of concern and any actions that we need to take. The main defense of, to abuse has to be the legislation. Applications have to be processed in line with the, uh, the legislation. The legislation permits a visa to be granted, then we cannot withhold it without being challenged legally. General alignment to the UK legislation is part of the requirements of the CTA, along with the Crown other Crown dependencies. We can make changes to accommodate our specific needs. For a number of reasons, our legislation has drifted away from the UK, which in itself has presented loopholes and areas of risk, not only for the island, but also for the UK and other Crown dependencies. Immigration is complex, not only to administer, but also to understand. The UK has a large legal team working on consolidating and simplifying their legislation and we are looking to make their guidance easier. We don't have the resources or the capability to do this ourselves, to we are quite greatly reliant on the UK as much as possible. A review is therefore underway to identify areas where we need to maintain our differences in legislation from that of the UK for economic and social reasons. The ability to apply tailored immigration policies within our overall framework of integrated immigration laws continues to be important to allow each jurisdiction to respond to local immigration and labour needs. Identifying areas where we simply cannot or it is not practical to comply with the requirements in the UK legislation determines how we are going to address those areas to provide assurance that they do not provide a risk to the CTA. 
An example of this would be the UK's requirement in terms of registration and regulation of immigration advisors. We do not have the resources or infrastructure to undertake this part of the legislation and need to find another way and means to provide assurance against risk of abuse. It's a big task. The longer we leave it, the more the issues it becomes for us and for the UK, especially as we move into the area of digitization and we place more reliance on the UK systems to pro process applications. So finally, I'd just like to talk a little bit about where we are going with digitization. Whilst everything else in the department is going on whirling away in the background, there is a huge digitization project underway. The UK Home Office is currently spending billions on a program aimed at digitizing the border. As part of this digitization, we will be introducing a new passport system that will fundamentally transform the way individuals apply for their passport on the island and will be a significant move forward for aligning with the new digitization strategy outlined in the island plan. The new system is a modern digital application experience where the customer is guided through the application process by the system and their journey differs depending on the answers to different questions. The experience is fully, fully digital, including submission and validation of digital photographs. This was due to be introduced in the next couple of years by the UK. They have had to divert the majority of their project resource to work on the high demand for UK passports that they are currently seeing. This has delayed the process but also the system will be used by the Crown Dependencies and Gibraltar. The islands are totally dependent on the UK for developing this system, and we need to go to their timeframes. At the moment, the implementation in the island is looking to be in 2027. It's disappointing, as I know we all find that the process of passport application is, is cumbersome but the digitization is on the way. By April 2025, all those visiting the UK, except the British and Irish citizens, who do not have a visa, will need an electronic travel authorization in order to get on board a boat or a plane to get to the UK. This is seen as a major step forward to help against abuse of the immigration system and will bring the UK in line with many other jurisdictions across the globe, including Europe. The ETA will be a digital application and will be linked to Traveller's Passport. It will cost around £10 and permit multiple journeys for up to six months at a time over a two-year period or until the passport runs out. Under the CTA agreement, the UK have committed to providing this facility for the Crown dependencies. Although the time frame is yet to be agreed, we are keen to progress this as quickly as possible. In addition to this, the UK are introducing fully digital immigration system, which means they will be replacing physical documents with the online record of immigration status which will be known as an e-visa. This digital record will replace passport endorsements such as wetting stamps and vinaigrette stickers in passports. Vinaigrette. The Isle of Man is heavily reliant on the UK digital immigration system and will be included in the e-visa programme. But at the moment, we don't have the exact time frame. Many jurisdictions globally no longer have wetting stamps to verify immigration status. This is now all done electronically and we need to keep pace with the digitization process. Another strand to this digitization process is the authority to carry scheme, which makes airlines and ferries operators responsible for assuring 
the passengers they carry have authority to enter the UK. This system should prevent those that do not have the necessary visa requirements from travelling. Of course, alongside the work on introducing these digital projects, it is, ne it, it is needed to make sure the necessary local legislation is in place. That in itself is no small task. The Isle of Man and other Crown dependencies are all working together with the UK to put these systems in place. The success of this project is such importance that we have formed a specific team in immigration to undertake the work for the next two years, and they will work solely on this project. As you can see, it's been a huge amount of work being undertaken in the immigration team. We have been fighting fires for so long, it's sometimes easy to lose sight of our overall goals. All these measures we put in place contribute to the overall goal, which is to provide an excellent service to our local employers and those wanting to come and live and work in the island. An immigration system is easy for employers and applications to use, is clear and easy to understand, and efficient in its delivery, which could be a real selling point for the island. Any system, however, has to make it difficult for those looking to exploit it. It is a fine line between the two, but one we will continue to work towards this ultimate goal. Thank you.